Hey, what's going on, you beautiful people? My name's Tie-Dye. I hope you guys had a pretty awesome day today. My day's been pretty awesome so far. So in this video, I had the pleasure of sitting down and speaking with Jonah Loeb, one of the character artists who helped work on the Elder Scrolls series as well as the Fallout series. We talked about a bunch of different stuff, starting off with his origin story and how we got into the industry to begin with. We then also talked about how to improve your art, things that you should be keeping in mind and how to balance your art life with your real life and have them sort of bounce off of each other in a very beneficial way. We also talked about burnout advice things to do to sort of avoid that sort of very tricky tricky area of the art world as well as we talk about his experience working in an environment of a studio as well as working as an independent artist and what are the pros and cons of doing each so i had an absolute blast speaking with jonah very very kind man i highly recommend going into the description of this video and checking out his social media let him know that i say hi and uh, give him some love for taking the time to to sit down and answer all of these questions here so anyways thank you once again jonah but with Without any further ado, let's dive into the interview itself. Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. Today we have a very special guest. You may not know him directly by name, but if you've played through any major Bethesda title, his characters and creatures you have made have probably impacted your gameplay in one way or another, whether that's a good thing or not. So without any further ado, I'd like to introduce you all to Jonah Loeb. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Jonah Loeb. Uh, I am an artist, an illustrator, a writer, and a game developer. Um, and I think you you probably know me from my work on the Fallout and Elder Scrolls series. Yes, very, very, uh, a lot of stuff under your tool belt there, man. I, I got to say, the more and more I looked into your history and the work that you've done, I kept going like, whoa, what, what hasn't this guy done, really? You've worked on AAA games, you're a 2D and a 3D artist at a very high level, you're currently writing a book. Like, uh, I think just to start off and just to get everyone on the same page here, I think we'd all love to hear a little bit about your history, you know, from the time you kind of wanted to get into games or, or started your art career into where you are now. What was that sort of journey and process like for you? Sure. Uh, good question. So, um, well, hello, everybody. Thanks for taking the time to hang out and listen. Um, uh, I start, you know, I, I've always been interested in, in art. Um, I know that when I was little, I just drew a lot. I was, I kind of was at home a lot, uh, only child, so kind of just had to entertain myself. So that was always a thing that I did a lot um, because, you know, nobody else could entertain me for me. Um, so I always did that. And I like, I have always been attracted to monsters and creatures and, and animals. Um, animals have always been my favorite, um, as I'm sure probably a lot of people who are listening, they feel the same way. Um, and so I knew kind of growing up that art was going to be something that I was going to do. And then I knew that, um, I wanted to do, as I got into college and all that, I kind of realized that, that characters and monsters and creatures and animals were, were my calling. So, um, I, I've always been attracted to, to people and to creatures and the kind of the way they live and, and kind of fascinated by watching, you know, the. The, this, the little details and little, little all, all the different ways that life has kind of come in, in different shapes and forms and all the ways that personalities develop. So between those two things, I kind of came down on the side of I want to do creature design uh, for um, uh, for for movies or games. Um, I just love the storytelling component uh, of these mediums, and I wanted to create things that people could interact with that. Um, that they would kind of connect with on some level um, and that would elicit kind of an emotional reaction. So after I graduated college, I kind of determined that games were probably the route, the route for me because I remember I went to visit Pixar. There'd been a, a, a graduate of my college who ended up at Pixar. And I thought that that was definitely where I wanted to go. And then I went out there and he was showing me how he was spending his days um, making the beads of water uh, technology for cars too and he was very excited about it but I just was like oh boy like this this does not look like my thing at all um so I figured that if I was going to join the movie industry I'd probably be you know the guy in charge of of grass for the first couple of years or something and I just mm -hmm. couldn't kind of I just did not want to do that so I decided that games were probably better because there's a lot more game companies out there and a lot more opportunities Kind of for growth and so i looked at the game the game industry uh, and that's kind of the direction i ended up taking 
Yeah. Did you go to college specifically for like an art related field or I'm assuming saying that when your colleagues went off to Pixar, it had to be something to do with 3D or was it just traditional art or animation or what exactly did you do and why did you why did you choose to go there exactly? Um, so I went to a school called Skimor. It's a regular liberal arts college. It had a strong art program, though. Um, and so, you know, I knew that even though there was no question about me doing art, that that was something I was going to pursue. Um, I, I did not want to just go to art school uh, because I kind of, I, I'm so fascinated by so many different topics, as I guess you you mentioned at the, at the mm-hmm. intro. And I just wanted a chance to kind of learn a bunch of about about the world about um psychology and about the history of art and and like any number of topics um and and creative writing and and uh, that kind of thing um i wanted to learn all these different things so i majored in art and i uh, uh you know i i graduated as kind of a, a an art major but um i was kind of i had a bit more of a varied uh, experience um, and then not, not quite so directed. So actually when I graduated college, um, I didn't really have a, a resume that was ready to, to, to compete with people who had gone to game colleges or that kind of thing, or who had actually specifically worked in games, um, or who had developed or, or had got a degree for games. So, um, I basically took the time to look at a whole bunch of tutorials online, a whole bunch of videos and started training myself on on the character art pipeline, um, trying to kind of figure out, you know, how to get a job in the industry. And I was definitely gunning for Bethesda. Um, I had played Morrowind my junior year and was so excited and so into it because it was so original uh, and unlike other fantasy on the market. Uh, So I loved that. And then I applied to them this summer for, for an internship between my junior and senior year uh, they weren't offering an internship. I just applied for one, uh, and they did not write me, write me back. <laughs> <laughs> and then I applied uh, for a job after college, and then didn't hear back then either. And so then I decided that I needed to to figure out what to do. So that's when I began that campaign of self learning, where I realized that I did not have the knowledge. Uh, my 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 school, uh, uh, that had given me a good arts education, had not prepared me for um, a job in the industry. So that's when I went home and just spent eight months working on that and uh, retooled myself and applied a third time. Uh, And this time sent my resume directly into Todd Howard, the executive producer, and then followed up two days later just to say, hey, Mr. Howard, I don't know, you know, you don't know who I am or whatever, but I just sent this thing to you. I just wanted to make sure that you got it. Um, And then he wrote back 20 20 minutes later and said, I got it, I liked it, we'd like to give you an art test. And that's kind of how it began. That is, that's actually crazy to think about. So I think, okay, so first of all, having that as kind of your first, you know, step into the industry is is pretty insane. It's a pretty good like indicator that you're doing something right. Um, (laughs) But I do want to ask, like, was that initially for the position that you had um, on the Elder Scrolls games and the Fallouts, like right into character art? Um, It was actually, so they hadn't, um, they hadn't done um, Fallout yet, but my art test that they gave me was a fallout character and I, and it was and that and that was so actually i got kind of a a heads up early they didn't they never said it was for fallout but i saw it and i said wait a second that looks like fallout <laughs> like from back in the day i when i used to play that as a kid it reminds me of fallout um and then it, when i once i got there it was revealed that they had bought the ip um so that was kind of exciting but uh yeah it was for the same uh position actually and i think i got in because i kind of knew a couple things that I guess some people there didn't. Um, mostly ZBrush. You know, at the time ZBrush was kind of a new cutting edge thing. And Bethesda, it's a very um, steady employment there. You know, if you get a job there, it's really you know they're not they haven't gone out of business ever. So there hasn't been an enormous amount of turnover. Um, so there's, there's a lot of people there who had done you know done their thing and and were really good at their respective you know um, uh, corners of of the of the, um, the production cycle, but they did not know these new texts. So I knew from studying after college, you know, what, what were people using? What was the, what was the, what was the thing? Uh, they said ZBrush. And so I said, okay, well, that probably, that's probably my in, you know, it, it's, it's as an artist and not really a tech person, it was able, it was a program that allowed me to um, kind of bridge the gap between being a, a, a programming 
type individual of which I am lousy um, to be uh, to kind of with a tactile, you know, using a Wacom tablet, uh, actually creating 3D sculpture. So I think that's what gave me the leg up and, and caused me to be noticed um, in addition to just kind of showcasing that I was a good uh, artist, you know. And the, 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 what the, the knowledge I've been given up to that point was that you can train an artist to be a game developer, but you can't necessarily train a game developer to be an artist. So I figured what I had over other people was that I was an artist. And if I could just prove that I was a great artist, then they might forgive my technical um, um, shortcomings and, yeah. and provide me a, a gig. And I ended up, that ended up, that's, that was ended up being a bet that paid off. So yeah, it seems like everything sort of lined up like perfect timing with the, the new software, your interests, everything sort of just clicked and uh, it all kind of worked out. Um, I do, cause we were talking about this briefly when we were messaging back and forth, but I do have a question about you uh, specifically when you said you sort of, you buckled down, you spent eight months just working on your portfolio. Um, I think a lot of people, myself included, are very curious to hear about what exactly were you practicing? What were you doing? And, and what were you doing for those eight months to sort of spend your time as efficiently as possible? A lot of times people do put in the work and they put in the practice, but it doesn't really matter if you're doing it in all the wrong places because your quality isn't going to really noticeably, you know, improve. So to, so to say in eight months you were able to you know, get some really solid workout is, is pretty impressive. I think a lot of people would want to know about how you really did that. Um, good question. Um, so when I went out, uh, so when I was looking for a job and I couldn't figure out how to get a job, I went to SIGGRAPH, which was uh, this computer animation convention out in LA. And I kind of shopped my portfolio around and to all these potential employers and basically didn't even pitch myself as, hey, can you hire me? It was much more like, hey, can you look at this? and tell me why I'm not getting hired. Like, what is it that you are not seeing? And so I had done all these different drawings. I had all these pieces of art. Um, I had some snippets from this five minute long computer animated movie that I'd done, which had taken me like a whole year. Um, and, uh, you know, and basically they were all saying, well, listen, this is all very impressive, but um, you need to showcase a, uh, a mastery in one particular field. So you have to demonstrate like kind of a plug and play employee ability. Um, so he said, basically, identify the job that you know you want, and you showcase uh, an uh, expert's abilities within that role. So um, you mentioned, you know, that it's kind of hard to know how to direct your efforts. Mm -hmm. I basically looked up, you know, okay, I want to be a character artist. And as I understand it, that means I need to showcase a, a specialty in making characters. So I, oh, and then not just showcase a, a potential to make characters, but showcase an ability to make characters uh, and use the character art, art pipeline and the various software is required. So I looked up online again, I, I, bought, I bought a book or two on, on kind of edge looping on an animation and that kind of thing. Not that I was going to be an animator, but I figured I needed to know how to make models that were animator friendly and I needed to showcase that ability. Um, so I bought a book or two and then I just looked up a whole bunch of uh, tutorials. I browsed through a whole bunch of forums. Whenever I had a problem, I would look on the forums and ask questions or just search and search and search for the answers. And I basically demonstrated, I, I basically focused on my ability to model out a character with proper edge looping, to uh, ZBrush a character and showcase that I knew this new program. Um, that I could render and that I could UV map and texture. So I, did, I wasn't very good at that last bit at all, um, but I had a basic understanding of it um, and I demonstrated, I demonstrated that understanding. So that's how I directed my efforts over the course of the next, those eight months. I just worked literally, you know, eight hours a day, um, all day at home, um, just working, 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 working. Um, and so, yeah, by, by directing my efforts and in, in picking something specific, um, I basically was able to showcase to the company that they could hire me and that I could begin to do work almost immediately upon being hired. And I think that's important. I think a lot of people who go into video games or, uh, you know, um, they know they want to be involved in video games somehow. So they kind of acquire all these different general skills and those general skills will certainly serve you over the course of a career. But when you're trying to break in, you know, uh, you have you have to, you know, it's, it's like you're, you're kind of throwing, 
your resume like a spear out into the world, hoping it hits something. And um, you want to sharpen the edge of that spear and basically make it clear that, you know, anywhere you get hired, you can start working on day one. So it's a really good, good call to try to identify what you're best at, what you like most, and then just research what's required of that, of that job and just do it, do it, do it, do it, do it. Right. Because I'm just sort of looking through your portfolio right now and I've noticed that pretty much everything is character related, right? But every once in a while, you'll see some sort of weapon poke through or something like that. But that's obviously like after the fact, you did all your practice on your characters, you understand modeling, sculpting, retopo, texturing, you can then apply it to other things, right? Like it, it's not like your knowledge is limited to the one thing that you want to specialize in, but it just makes the most sense to put all of your attention in that area, right? Yes, exactly. So, um, you know, the pipeline is almost identical um, with regards to making an axe or a sword as it is to a character um, when it comes to video games. Uh, the knowledge base is a bit different, but it's, it's, you know, it's, it's essentially the same workflow. So I definitely have been branching out and doing all kinds of things. And when I did the actual characters uh, to show my demo reel, I, um, I did four different kinds of characters. I did um, this red horned or black horned red skinned devil uh, very basic uh, looking, but basically I, I did that in ZBrush and rendered it in ZBrush and poly painted it. I did a cartoonish yellow skin, four armed um, alien with buck teeth and big black eyes. And it was very cute. Um, I did uh, a robotic, a mechanical uh, spider with a glowing abdomen. And then I did a Merdural, which uh, M Y R D A R A A L, something like that. They're they're <laughs> monsters from the Wheel of Time series, and I did I did one of them with with black armor and a hanging cloak, and a sneer on his face. Um, so that was you know the, the the purpose of doing that was to showcase that I could do many different kinds of creatures, you know, not just one kind or whatever, but you know. So I kind of avoided you know, biker babes and big mech warrior characters, just because I figured that was, that was what was populating so many, so much of the industry. I kind of wanted to go for things that nobody else would have thought of. Um, you know, again, tr again, just trying to figure out ways to stand out. Yeah. Do you think having the, the variance in characters, like not just different from everyone else, but having multiple different sets within your own demo reel really helped you out? Because I'm just trying to get all this straight. You were really recommending having like one specialty, but then you had some stylized and some realistic. Do you think that's uh, something that people should sort of aim towards, sort of have their specific area of expertise, but then sort of broaden it out within that one specific niche topic? Um, if, you, if, if you were able to, yes. I mean, you always want to tailor your portfolio to the employer. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, to, in that regard, the cartoonish one may have been a little silly but um but it wasn't you know i it's i was i was showcasing an ability um to handle form creatures and to him to, to to create personality and i think really the best thing that you can do in a in a portfolio is to make somebody stop and look closer um at what you've done because it's something they've never seen before so a yellow four-armed alien looks very different from a mechanical spider looks very different from a red horned devil um and each one has kind of a different, you know, they each had different colors and that kind of thing. And I was just basically trying to really make people stop and pay attention because um, if they see one thing in there and then the next thing they see is very similar to that one, um, that could be, that could be useful in that, you know, like, Hey, look, I, I have mastered this one particular style, but, um, but again, the idea of showcasing mastery in one area is what you're going for. So characters in general, I wanted to prove the characters in general were my thing and that, there was nothing they could throw me that I couldn't tackle. Um, whether or not that was yeah, that was the case, I was, that's what I was trying to prove. So yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a really good way to put it. Honestly, that that I've never really thought about it too much, but that makes complete sense. Um, one thing I did want to touch on before we totally like blew right past it was. So we were talking about the crunch time. We were talking about how for eight months you were working. You said eight hours a day, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of people. Once they start doing that daily, seven days a week, they eventually run into, they, they get sort of burnt out in a sense. I'm sure you've definitely experienced this before. What is any advice that you have when you, you really want to get the results, you really want to put in the practice, but you find yourself after sitting down and working for a little bit, starting to feel tired and burnt out and, and not as motivated as you'd like to be? 
Yeah, motivation is hard to keep up. Um, I try to mix it up. I try to, you know, always be challenging myself, always be giving myself something um, new, um, kind of like, you know, I kind of think of it as artistic calisthenics, um, where, you know, if, if you're getting stuck on this one thing and it's really driving you nuts, um, moving on, doing something else, maybe putting it to the side and, and tackling something else and tackling something that's, um, that um, is, is different in nature. So art in general can be hard and it can be hard to kind of buckle down and put in that time, um, especially on some of the bigger um, things you might want to pursue, you know, bigger pieces of art, you know, on one given character that takes a long time to do. Um, so it, it can be kind of frustrating and, um, and you can kind of just kind of get tired and not want to do it anymore. Uh, in that kind of instance, I would kind of sit back. I would, I would step away from the computer and I would pick up a sketch pad. I would sit down and, and turn on something on TV and then just sketch and just sketch anything, uh, literally like nothing. And, and this is, you know, I'm, I'm a big proponent. Uh, if anyone's seen my website or seen any of my interviews, I'm a big proponent in creating bad art, not being afraid to create bad art. Um, so the idea being that, um, you know, we don't learn new things unless we experiment. And um, the more we experiment, the better we get. But experiments necessitate failure. Um, so uh, that's something I've been doing a lot of in recent years is, is just kind of not being so afraid to create something cool all the time. And when one project is really getting me down because it's taking too long or what have you, um, I try to remind myself that picking at it day by day, putting a couple of hours in every day and then doing something else is still moving forward. Um, and as long as you're doing, a, you know, a different kind of art, because remember art is complementary. You know, if, if all you do is do computer modeling and you don't do anything else, you are missing out. You're, you're missing out on a whole bunch of potential and a whole uh, suite of abilities that you didn't know that you could get because because art really is complementary and there's lots of different things you can learn from doing different kinds of things. So I always look at it as moving forward. If, you know, if I if I'm tired of something and I move on and I do some you know something else. So I you know I honestly believe, and this is something that I know a lot of people have to get used to, but I honestly believe that time spent making bad art in your sketchbook is time well spent. That's that's a good way to spend your time because you're ridding yourself of the fear of the blank page, you're taking chances that you wouldn't otherwise take, and you're gonna pick up learning that you would not otherwise pick up. Um, so I'm definitely a big fan of, of kind of branching out and trying these different things um, and keeping your, keeping your mind fresh. And then when you've done that for a few hours, you come back to the other thing and, and get into it and, and do what you need to do to stay focused. So I definitely watch like a lot of TV while I'm working. I have two monitors here. I just, I turn on a show that I don't care that much about because I don't, you know, if it's a good show, I don't want to miss the story. <laughs> exactly. But if, but if I don't care about the story that much, if it's kind of like a B show or a show I've seen before, then I just turn it on in the background and I just work. And the narrative keeps me kind of in the zone and keeps me from like kind of getting so bored. So the, the work I start doing becomes very automatic. Uh, at the moment I'm watching Critical Role, uh, which is a, bunch of voice actors sitting around playing D and D. Um, and it's super fun. It's way more fun than you would think. And it's great because it feels a little bit like a podcast. It feels a little bit like you're hanging out with your friends because people are just hanging out, talking and laughing and shooting the shit. Um, but there's also a narrative and that narrative keeps me, keeps my ear entertained and keeps my mind fed while my hand, um, kind of starts, you know, just starts doing the thing that it, it needs to be doing right now. Um, so I, it allows me to zone out. Yeah, no, that, that's, I honestly really like that point that you brought up with the whole, like, get used to making bad art. As long as, I think as long as you're aware that it's bad art, it's, it's going to motivate you to, once you go back to your original project to really just sort of say, all right, it's time to get back to the good stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, like sort of have that outlet to just say, okay, let's just switch it up. Let's have a little refresher. Um, keep the mind busy. Um, yeah. One thing I do sort of want to branch out from this, this, um, topic that we're on right now is I think we're on the same page when it comes to daily work, right? Like we're always trying to improve a little bit every single day. I think a lot of people are in that position, especially like I'm a college student. I know a lot of my classmates um, are in the same position. And one of the things that we're all starting to realize, and I, I feel like you've probably 
found a pretty good solution to this would be, I think a lot of us with art, you can always improve, right? You can always do better. You can always do more and put more hours in every single day. Mm -hmm. And for some of us, we find it difficult to find a balance between how much work should you put in and sort of how much time should you spend away from it all? You know what I mean? I think it's really easy to sort of get like super focused on your work. And before you know it, you know, weeks have gone by or you haven't talked to your friends in a little bit or something like that. Like, do you have any advice for sort of balancing your art life and trying to get as good as you can with sort of balancing everything else that's going on in the world? Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think maintaining friendships is, is essential. I think getting out of the house and this, and getting out of your comfort zone is absolutely essential. Um, I think a lot of people forget that art, um, requires, um, new ideas constantly. I think a lot of people who experience creative block, um, have not traveled in a while or have not gone for a walk in the park or, you know, or who have not, you know, they've not themselves they've been kind of sitting and staring at this art and trying to make more and more art but they can't output everything uh, because there's nothing really being being put in so um taking the time to see friends to have interesting conversations to you know go to that party that maybe you don't really want to but just going to it because who knows you who you can meet or whatever um going on that walk going for a run going to the gym these are things that give your brain a break and let you unplug and which I think eventually um, if you're doing it right, you know, I'm not going out and partying and getting wasted, et cetera, but going out, you know, for the social aspect for whatever, I mean, listen, you know, people can party however they want, but <laughs> yeah, the, the, the idea being that, that these things can kind of feed you um, is very real, I think. So um, uh, yeah, like, like basically recognizing that the other aspects of your life are not just important in the abstract, but that, they, but that indulging in them can feed your artistic side. Um, that, I, that concept that, um, that uh, you, you need to like kind of have the idea of, of creativity and, and of invention. Uh, we, seem, we seem to think that our minds are capable of infinite invention, but it's not true. Um, you need to input data to output data. And you need to, in this case, you need to input experiences to output something like an experience. So um, recognizing that the rest of your life is, can help your art and not, not just be an imp impediment to it is kind of critical. I, I know some people who I follow on Twitter and our Instagram who are really, really amazing in some ways, but you know, um, don't get out much and don't, you know, don't do a lot of different things. And their art reflects that. Um, they can, you know, they can learn to do one thing like very well, but they don't really get the chance to branch out um, in some ways. And so I think that that's, I kind of forget the original question, but I guess I think, <laughs> I think recognizing that, that getting out of the house and getting, and especially getting away from the computer, definitely getting away from the computer um, can really help move the train of your mind onto a different track. And that's really what we need as artists. I think a lot of artists are also prone to depression um, you know, for all kinds of varying reasons, but then, but then the, the uh, impetus of, uh, of an artist, which is to stay home and be alone and focus on your art, that can be very, you know, the, those two things can feed off each other in a very negative way. So recognizing that, you know, just like a dog needs to be walked or a dog needs to meet other dogs, you got to get out there and you got to kind of experience things and kind of try to to um, treat them not just as as uh, asides from your artistic world, but as kind of necessary to them. You know, just being a basically a basic. You know, trying to focus on what makes you a happy human being. You know, I think a lot of young individuals looking to join this industry are are so focused on it, which is great, which they should be, um, but that they forget that that you know, and this is the kind of thing that you learn as you get a little older. That being happy is the most important thing, and trying to figure out what you need to do to be happy and doing and starting starting that early on is a very good practice i think bit of a convoluted answer for you there. <laughs> no i think you answered it perfectly um yeah because that's i think you pretty much answered that directly for me i'm honestly always in this position where i'm like i gotta get more work done i gotta get more work done this whole summer has been practiced but you're right it's all about sort of a balance how are you going to put stuff out if you don't have stuff coming in right um absolutely so that's 
I mean, incredibly important advice. I know a lot of people were asking me about that as well, and I didn't have an answer. So I'll just direct them to exactly what you said there. Um, I mean, I, mean I you know, you the number of ideas you come up with just by reading a book, you know, for your art. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's kind of amazing. You wouldn't think that just a novel or something would kind of give you uh, fuel, but it totally does. So, yeah, you got to feed the mind, right? Exactly. Um, I think so we spent a lot of time talking about like personal work, but you're in this sort of unique position where you've had that experience working at, at, at larger studios. So I kind of wanted to ask about your opinion on all of that, um, because I like how long have you been working at uh, Bethesda or when did you start working there exactly? Uh, I started working there in 2006. OK, so, yeah, it's, it's been a bit of time at <laughs> yeah, the end of 2005, maybe. Um, and then I, I left in late 2012 okay so yeah. seven years I, I was there yeah that gives you like some some great great insight into what i'm about to ask here just because a lot of people have very differing opinions on working in studios like i've heard my fair share of terrible things my fair share of amazing things i was wondering if you like like what is your stance on it all do you have any horror stories of like crazy crunch time or has it overall been pretty good um i don't have any horror stories um being an artist means that you're kind of at the beginning of the food chain or the, or the assembly line of, of work. So artists usually get, get, get the most um, reprieve from crunch time. Programmers get it the worst because they're the ones who have to fix all the bugs. And for those who know Bethesda games, you know, you know that the bugs are a thing that we have um, in great numbers because there's such, so there's such massive and flexible games mm -hmm that things break all the time. You know, it's not like a, a game on rails. Uh, you know, I played Doom, the new Doom twice through and it basically never crashed like ever. The frame rate was always amazingly, like, everything was always perfect, but it's like there's is, their game is not a Bethesda game. It's not as flexible and, and you can't do as many things. You can basically just kill everything with, you know, with style. Um, so, the, 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 the programmers definitely put in most of that time. I did not. Um, I don't have any horror stories um, to share. Uh, I just know what kind of feeds me and what kind of kept me going. Um, so I really liked working there. I really dug it. I felt very supported by my, by my teammates. I learned an enormous amount. So learning from your peers is really a huge advantage. You know, working by yourself, you don't get the luxury of of people around you who, who know what they're doing, who can help you through a problem, or who just give you their general advice on whatever you're working on. Um, that was one thing we we, asked, we we took advantage of a lot at the character art team at Bethesda, was we respected each other's opinions and we wanted feedback on our work all the time. Um, so you, you lose that. You also lose the steady paycheck and you lose um, a lot of the, um, um, kind of prestige, so-called prestige of having worked at the place. So um, if it's a good place, you know, it's a good studio, then you get to like walk around and tell other people in the industry what you do and maybe they're a fan of what you do and that's cool. Um, and when you're kind of an indie character, you don't really get that glamour unless your thing is amazing and the odds of that are very low because most indie games crash, whatever, or, you know, don't never, never make it out the door. Mm -hmm. So um, it's definitely a trade-off. Um, for me, I eventually left, you know, for a couple of reasons. One, because my wife was up in New York and I wanted to go be with her. And um, two, I really wanted to write this fantasy series. And, you know, they, um, the, the, so the issue with working at a game company, uh, especially one like Bethesda, is you, you weren't really allowed to work on other things kind of in that same time. And that really wasn't okay with me. I, you know, I really wanted to do other things and I wanted to write this book more than anything. And, and so at a certain point, I felt also um, that I was kind of being, uh, um, you know, I was just part of this assembly line and I didn't want to be part of the assembly, assembly line anymore. I really liked, I was really grateful for the, the work they gave me. I, you know, I got to do the dragons, all the way. I got to do most of the monsters for these games and, and I, and like, I will never ever talk bad about that experience because I was lucky to do that. And um, it was a privilege to do that. There was a lot of really talented people on the team that also could have done that, but I was chosen for the role. Um, and I was very appreciated for that. But I was not appreciated for other things that I could do because um, I had a specialty and you know it was understood that I would stick to that specialty. And at a certain point, I just realized, you know, I'm actually 
in some ways, I'm, my power is quite limited here. And because this is a big company, um, everyone's got a different role and everyone's a little bit jealous of their role. So you can't really step in and, and kind of offer too many suggestions here and there because really not people aren't, you know, people got their own plans, their own ideas. And, and there's also the big, the big idea, the big plan, big goal of the team. And, um, you know, that goal is not wrong. You know, I mean, Todd Howard led our teams and he dictated a lot of what we did. He knew how to do that. I did not know how to do that. Um, uh, but, you know, from a satisfaction point of view, it's not satisfactory uh, to do that. At least it wasn't for me uh, for the long term. At a certain point, I just, re I just thought to myself, you know, as a person in the industry, I'm doing very well. I'm super excited. Like, I, I feel like I have respect and prestige and all this stuff that I'm doing. I can do this one thing really well. Um, but I can't, but, I, but as a human, I'm not really growing. I kind of stopped growing. And, and, I, and even, even as a professional, I, my pipeline from the very first year that I did, uh, I started working there to the last year I worked there uh, had changed very little. You know, I was doing much bigger, more prestigious pieces of work, but it was still the exact same workflow. So from an artistic point of view, I was kind of feeling stymied and, and I was looking at the concept artists there and other artists online. And I was like, wow, these people are so talented in these ways that I am not. And I'm, I'm jealous. Like I, I want to be able to do that. Um, so I, I, I decided that I was going to leave and work on my art and painting and work on my writing. And, and uh, thankfully I had a, a wife who um, does good work and makes good money um, enough to support us, you know, more or less for the time being. And I'd also saved up some money at Bethesda. And so I went out on my own and cause I wanted to learn, you know, I, you know, I was still young, you know, I wanted to learn new things and, and, and Bethesda would let me back if I wanted to get back in. So, you know, with that kind of safety net, kind of had no excuse just but to go out and try new things. So the pros is you get great feedback. Uh, you get great um, team members. Um, you have a nine to five. Um, you get, you know, health care and you get a regular paycheck and that kind of stuff is absolutely gorgeous. And when you don't have it, you really miss it. Um, and, and if you're lucky, you get to ship some titles. Um, but if, um, but then the other side of it is you are kind of a little bit more of a cog in a machine. Um, you don't really get to dictate very much about what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and from, from that kind of perspective of kind of vaulting forward in your life and in your, your, your suite of experiences, uh, it can be very really useful to a point. And then, and then you have to figure out if you, if you want to make a lateral lateral move within the company, or if you want to try at a different company, or if you want to change a change a career. So, um, and so the, the the benefits of being on your own is I get to, I get to pick my own hours, I get to work from home, I get to um, work on any number of things that I want to do, um, I get to kind of spend my days in completely different ways than I would have otherwise, and you just learn a lot more. Um, it's also a lot tougher. You know, people think it's really cushy and nice to be working from home all the time. And it can be to a point, but it can also be, you know, quite um, existentially uh, um, damaging if, <laughs> if you don't have much of a goal or, or things aren't going particularly well, you know, it's not a, it's not a very secure place to be. Um, so it's, you know, it's, there's, there's pluses and minuses to, to both. Sweet. I mean, that, that's, Wow, that's a lot more information than I was expecting, but all very, very, like, really awesome stuff to hear. Um, I did just a little bit before we, like, move past Bethesda, there was one thing I did want to ask you about specifically. Yeah. And that was, so you did mention that you felt more like a, like a cog in the system, right? Yeah, yeah. And that's, this is, I mean, this is my personal, you know, experience. Yeah, and, and. I more or less wanted to ask that just because um, I was looking through your portfolio and one of the, my, like my favorite piece from you is personally the the giant from Skyrim. Oh, thanks. Um, I had a chance to, to look through and, and read the description there and you said you were able to base that off of, I can't remember if it was your father or your grandfather. My, my um, father, yeah. <laughs> right. I wanted to ask about how much freedom do you have typically, like I know obviously you have a lot of restrictions as you were saying, you're part of a system, but how much freedom do they allow someone like you in your position to sort of have when making these creatures or these characters um, before you can hand it off to someone else? Um, you know, I, I was given a lot of freedom, actually, uh, a ton of freedom. I can't really complain about that at all. Um, they trusted me. You know, I, I had to earn that trust over the course of years. 
but um, they trusted me to make my own calls. So every time I got a design from, you know, I, you know, it was time for me to make something new and I would meet with the art director and with, and, 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 and he'd tell me what the thing was. And th so I, then I would say, cool. Okay, great. So tell me what of these designs that the concept artists have come up with are your favorites. And I would ask that to the art director and they would tell me, and then I would make sure going forward, not to eliminate those parts. Like that's what the, that's what really attracted the art director. So that's what I can't screw with. Um, then, and then I would go to the, um, but, then, but then I kind of figured everything else was more or less up for grabs. And then I would go to the um, concept artist who made the image. Um, in this case, often it was this guy, Adam Adamowitz, but it could, there's two other guys as well who worked there eventually. Um, and I would say, what were you looking at? What were your sources of reference when you created this? Because, um, you know, like I said before, um, it's not a good idea to kind of just go off of whatever is on in your head because that's a quick that's a way to become stale pretty quickly um, so I would ask them for what they were looking for and then they would tell me or show me what they were referencing when they worked on it and then that would give me a fresh uh, set of things for me to look at as I designed it but then I would kind of you know I would look at a lot of animal anatomy I would look at I would source from different things and, I would, and then I would kind of go off on my own and create my own thing so you know, with the giant, I think the initial drawings kind of reminded me of my father. Um, and I just decided to, uh, to just go with that. Cause you know, who, who knew who, who there would know that I was even doing that, you know? So I just did it. Um, but yeah, I, you know, for the dragon for Skyrim, for instance, I was given something, something in the neighborhood of 32 sketches and illustrations. And then they told me, and then they told me basically we want the, the kind of the head shape in this one and the body shape here. And then, this one has got the coloring that we dig, that kind of thing. So I would be sure to be respecting that and I'd be sure to be getting that. But then, but then otherwise it was kind of, I was free to experiment. So yeah, no, I had a lot of, I had a lot of uh, freedom and I'm really grateful for that. Oh, it's really good to hear. Is that um, like typically how it goes, do you think? Or, or is it more or less, uh, a lot more strict than that? Is Bethesda kind of like a good, I guess, sort of way to base off of other studios and how they work? Um, I don't know. Um, I'm not sure. I don't think it's always that flexible. I think it's some big studios, especially. I think a lot of work goes into the concept art. And then the idea from there is, you know, stick to the concept art. You know, don't, you know, don't go off script. Um, I had the benefit of working with that guy, Adam Madamowitz, who was that concept artist I was talking about. And he, his whole style was extremely fast and loose, really fast and loose, um, really scribbly. And so, you know, for some things, I remember I was supposed to design Shiogaroth's uh, outfit from Shiver, the Oblivion, Oblivion Shivering Isles. I was supposed to sculpt it in ZBrush. But the concept art was just scribbles all over his jacket. And I was like, I don't know what to do. And I kind of freaked out a little bit. I kind of like was like, I, I can't, I don't know what to do. I can't do this. Um, but that was early on in my, you know, tenure. Um, quickly thereafter, I kind of learned, okay, if, I, if, I, if it's not clear what something is, well, that's an opening for me to do whatever I want. Um, and so I think not every place is like that. Um, but I, whenever I try to do work a gig, I try to make it clear that I will be taking some liberties and I will be checking in uh, throughout the process with those people who are, who's, who's, who, whose gig this is um, to make sure that they are happy with it. And they're not like, you know, they're not seeing what I'm doing and like kind of hating it. Uh, I always want to make sure that I'm on the same page with people, but I really do, step into that space and kind of demand a little bit of free reign because otherwise I just get bored. You know, I, I just get bored of what we're doing. I'm not, my job is not a, a, a digital, a 3D transcriber. I don't, I don't take a 2D image and just make it 3D. I need space to do my own thing. Um, so it, fortunately Bethesda, everyone either really trusted me with that or just let me do it off the bat, whatever. Um, and, uh, and I, I, and I think that that's, you know, I, it, it, in my mind, that's what most 3d artists should be doing. Um, because a, it's more fun and B they're artists. Again, they're not, they're not supposed to be transcribers. Um, and so I think that, you know, and also the idea, the concept that all the cool and finished polished work is done by the concept artist. I just don't think it's true. I think any design has a whole host of 
you know, hopefully cool elements and a whole host of very hackneyed elements or just filler. And so if there's areas where it's been identified to me that this is really cool and that I shouldn't change elements of, of this, 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 and this, and yet everything is up, else is up for, up for grabs, well, then I know that I've taken all the cool original concepts and forms and shapes and ideas from that original concept art. And then now I get to fill in the cracks with all kinds of new Jonah-esque elements. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I hope that others get the same kind of freedom I, I got. Um, you know, it's not the case everywhere, but if you're a good artist and you demonstrate um, a, a talent and ability to, to improvise on your own, I think, you know, I think most companies would be pretty down to see what you can do. So, yeah. Yeah, that definitely seems ideal, right? Like if you're an artist and you've made it there, especially at, at a level like um, character artists at Bethesda, I think it makes sense to have everybody sort of influence that design a little bit with their own creativity, right? Um, one last thing I wanted to ask just because we're, we're getting a bit closer to an hour now, right? Uh, one thing I, I always love asking people is let's say you went back, you had the opportunity to talk to yourself even before you went to college, uh, when you were really young, younger, I should say, um, what would you, what would you say? What advice would you give to yourself? You know, just for people in general who are just trying to get into it, maybe people who have no experience at all, but really appreciate your work or really like the games that you've made. Um, what advice would you go back and say to yourself? Uh, with, with regarding art or, or game design or? Let's just go, let's go with art in general first, I suppose. Um, I think I would have uh, told myself to embrace the bad art mantra much earlier. Um, I only kind of got started using that mantra, you know, s I guess about seven years ago. The idea of like, hey, try to sit down and make drawings every day, um, drawings or studies or whatever. Um, but, but don't worry about how good or bad it looks. Just do it just, and just get a sketch pad and just plan not to show anybody, uh, and just do it. Um, because I noticed that when I started doing that on my own time, my work started improving much, much faster. So I think that would have made me, you know, I, I think I developed a fear of the blank page, uh, for, and for a while, especially while I was at Bethesda, basically didn't do 2D art. So, you know, in the, it's only in the years afterwards that I've really been tackling it again. But I think I, I think that was a, a whole lost opportunity. I think there was a lot of time there where I could have been getting better um, just by throwing caution to the wind and just having at it um, and just making it a low pressure thing and trying to, and trying to establish that discipline a little earlier on. That, that would have been, that would have been probably the best because I would have probably would have reaped the most benefits uh, in the in the easiest way, uh, if that would, if that had been the case. Okay. Well, I mean, you've given us so much great information. Uh, I once again, I cannot stress how much I, I appreciate you coming on here and sitting down and talking with me and giving us all this super super valuable uh, insight on everything. Um, before we head off, though, is there anything you want to say to anybody? Anything you want to promote or plug? Uh, anything you want to share at all? Um, well, thank you for the opportunity. Um, I, you know, I would, I would love to plug my book, but um, my book agent is still looking for um, uh, 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 publishers for it. It's a long process. The average, average wait time to hear back is nine months. So it's a very long process. So, um, but, but, um, so I can't exactly uh, uh, push that now. <laughs> I am going to be releasing a series of video tutorials uh, in the coming uh, months, probably in, in about three months from now, four months from now, I'll be releasing three different tutorials, um, hour long things, very art theory centric. So there's a lot of tutorials out there, um, but these will be um, kind of not just geared towards making you better at creature design or making you better at character and personality design, but making you a better artist in general. That's kind of my my thing. So I really believe that those will be, you know, I'm, I'm working on them now and I'm putting a lot of effort in. So I think anybody who's watching and who wants to join this industry and who wants to become a better artist you know, I wouldn't try to sell it if I didn't believe in it. So I really believe those are going to be good. Those are going to be great. Um, and, uh, but, but they're not out yet. And so if you're interested, just find me on Instagram, find me on Twitter, uh, or you can find me on Facebook, uh, and, um, uh, give me a follow and then trust me, you won't miss them when any of these things come out, comes out, you won't miss them. So on, on uh, Instagram, my handle is I am Jonah Loeb on Twitter. My handle is Jonah Loeb. And you can find me um, on Facebook at Jonah Lowe. Um, and so, yeah, f follow me in any one of these places and you won't miss out 
on any of the stuff I got cooking. Awesome. I'll definitely have all those things linked in the description. Um, if you guys are also watching this a bit further on, I'll have links to the novel as well as the tutorials down there as well. Like, obviously, I haven't seen them yet either, but I'll probably be picking them up. I honestly find that, at least for me, like I'm going to college for games and stuff like that, but mm. I, I learn way more from independent artists who are putting their information out there, especially people who have the experience. So I'm already going to start promoting this. So if it is down there, make sure to check it out. But um. Thank you so much for taking the time once again. I really do appreciate it. And for everyone watching, go check those links down there. Hopefully you guys all enjoyed. And uh, yeah, we'll uh, talk to you all later. Thank you so much. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye.